Anna. And I'm Carol. And this is the Real Talk Recreation Therapy Podcast. On this podcast, we talk about real experiences and real research that back up the use of recreation therapy as a method of treatment for a variety of populations. We try to keep it real as we address concerns and successes that we and other recreation therapists have had as we all navigate this awesome career field. We don't have it all figured out, but one thing we know for sure is everything gets a lot easier when you can talk it out with a friend. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Real Talk Recreation Therapy Podcast. We're really excited today to be interviewing Ellie Maddenberg, who is an RT that works in correction. So thank you so much for being here, Ellie. Of course. I'm just going to read a quick bio of Ellie before we get started, and then we'll interview her about what it's like to work in corrections, which I'm really excited to hear about and hear myths debunked and your your hot take on what it's like. So, okay. So Ellie was born and raised in a Chicago suburb. She attended the University of South Florida for her undergrad degree in biological health sciences. She had no idea what recreation therapy was until after she finished her degree and USF University didn't offer RT as a major. So then she attended the University of Tennessee for a therapeutic recreation master's program. She ended up in Utah to do her internship at the National Ability Center and she got into mental health through people she met at the National Ability Center. So super fun journey that you've had there and we're excited to hear more about how it went. Yeah, definitely. Happy to share. All right. So I feel like your bio kind of answered our question about how did you get into rec therapy a little bit, but could you maybe explain more about what drew you into rec therapy, why you decided to go from biological health sciences into this more specific kind of more niche field? Sure. So I originally thought I wanted to do physical therapy because I was like, oh, that's really cool. I did I had a job at a physical therapy clinic I was doing all the things with them but I was very bored and all I wanted to do was figure out how to do physical therapy and also play outside at the same time so I was talking to one of my cousins about it and she is a clinical therapist and she was telling me about rec therapy and how like sometimes she'll do a recreation-based therapy session and just kind of what that looked like. And at the time I just associated that type of therapy with just clinical mental health. And so then I started looking into recreation therapy and that's kind of how I ended up here. That's awesome. So I have not met very many recreation therapists that work in the field of corrections or specifically with the population of corrections. So how exactly did you get into working with that population? (laughs) Yeah, honestly, I... Uh, Like my bio said, I was working at the National Ability Center, and from people I met there, I got into a psychiatric hospital, and I was just kind of struggling with the way that the recreational therapy department was viewed at the hospital and how kind of, I don't even know, know how to explain it, but how it didn't really have as much value to the other people involved in the treatment Mm -hmm. and it was a constant battle every single day of trying to explain what rec therapy was and why it was important and the patients really benefited from it of course but there was just a lot of back and forth and arguing (laughs) with the administration in some way shape or form and so I was kind of looking for other jobs and just kind of trying to expand my knowledge in mental health. And I saw a job posting for corrections. I had no idea about anything that I was getting into. And I just said, okay, (laughs) they, they asked me if I wanted the job that day during the interview. And I just said, sure. (laughs) That's so cool. Very brave. And I, I think that your experience uh, is very common. We're actually interviewing someone in a couple of weeks about, about that struggle of like how rec therapy can be viewed more professionally with other professions because it is, it's a real struggle and it makes working hard. So 
stay tuned. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully have some good, good tips for those things. If, if listeners are feeling the same thing, because I know Carol and I definitely did with. Yeah. Like, I've listened to a few of your, of your episodes from before. And I heard a couple people mention that one <laughs> as well. <laughs> It's probably the, one of the most common things that I hear in RT. And I think it's, yeah, it's just common in our field. People have a hard time understanding how it can be therapeutic. But yeah. <laughs> we'll come back to that in just a second. But no so worries. day-to-day in corrections, what does that look like for you? Like walk us through what it is. Yeah. What do you do every day? <laughs> Honestly, I don't think there's such thing as day-to-day. It's just like everything is different all the time which I like, I don't do well with monotony. And so walking into something completely different every day is exciting to me and trying to problem solve with our treatment team. And so we have a meeting every morning with our custody staff, the officers, and they just kind of let us know what happened the evening before, after we all left and the night and then what was going on in the morning, kind of where everyone was at. And I work in the mental health building And we have therapists and, you know, a lot of people in a lot of different buildings, but um, I specifically work with mental health. My morning basically is just catching up on the meetings. And then I usually run a group or two. Sometimes I have an individual session and then the inmates have an 1130 count time. And so they're locked down from 1130 to one. And so that's just when the officers come by and make sure they are who they are and where they're supposed to be basically. And then so at one, they usually open back up somewhere in like a 15 minute range. And then I do one or two afternoon groups. Sometimes there's a session, a session somewhere in between there, and then they get locked down again at 430. So I do as much as I can in a very short amount of time. (laughs) Yeah, that's really interesting that that has got to be unique to that setting that like your your specific like there's specific times when you're not able to do groups like I know when we were working in Hawaii there were times when we didn't have groups trying to like do paperwork and stuff but in this setting there's times where it's like no they're like specifically cannot do anything right there so that's really interesting yeah definitely and you know there are some days where there's an incident that happens and I can't do any groups at all or you know, I can't do groups in the morning or in the afternoon or, you know, something pops off for lack of a better word. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's sometimes you just go with the flow. <laughs> are there other recreation therapists that work in other, you said you work specifically in mental health. Are there other recreation therapists that work at this correction facility that work in other areas? Not really. So there's me and then there's one other gentleman. He's been there for like 18 years. So (laughs) he and I both work in mental health. It's just the two of us right now. Hopefully we get to expand at some point in time, but I don't see that happening in the near future. And it's really cool. So kind of do some groups together sometimes or just kind of get people moving. And he'll work a little bit more with our geriatric population that's not my forte specifically. (laughs) So he does a lot of those. And I just work a lot with like our maximum security guys that we have in mental health, but we'll just kind of switch off on those. Well, that's super interesting. So that's a perfect segue into my next question for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the population that you work with? Like what's their ages? What kind of goals do you work with them? What barriers exist to practicing recreation? Just what are you doing with these people? Who are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's a loaded question. So I, like I said, work just with mental health. So a lot of these guys, I mostly work with men. Um, we do have one women's section, but at the moment it's kind of run as like a crisis unit. So most of our guys are with us either because they can't be in population for safety reasons or they have significant mental health issues. So, you know, like schizophrenia, bipolar, a lot of them come in very disorganized and psychotic. So they'll get referrals or will get referrals from other treatment teams or other places in the prison or other places throughout the state in the jail systems and stuff like that. 
And so we'll get referrals from them. They get assessed. And we have three different sections. One is more of a maximum security and one's more of a medium. And then one's more of like sort of kind of an outpatient. And so I work with kind of all of those guys. It depends. Right now I'm working on a creative writing group with some of the maximum security guys just trying to develop writing as a coping skill. It's challenging though, because a lot of the times there's a good amount of people that don't know how to read and some people that don't really know how to spell. So that can sometimes be a big barrier, which for obvious reasons, especially with a writing group. So it limits them. And, you know, sometimes with my individual sessions, we'll just do some art based things. So whether we're talking about like different leisure skills or recreation activities that they used to do or used to engage in, and then just kind of bring it to life through art, just because we have very limited space and limited props and what we can do. So a lot of the times, like I can't go out to their big yard just because there's no officers stationed out there. Um, so that's another barrier. Would that so be like where they when, would do like physical activity, the big yard? Is that Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we have stuff out there for them. They have basketball hoops and a pickleball court and we got some volleyball standards and there's a track. We're trying to get a greenhouse and do a bunch of that, like more outdoorsy things. But unfortunately with the staffing shortage in this whole country, we don't have the staff to have somebody stationed outside to do those things as like a therapeutic intervention. What would be some of the other safety considerations that you have to follow in terms of like the supplies that you can use with your people? Supplies wise, I mean, as long as I'm there, there's in certain areas, I am cautious to take you know, certain sharp objects. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, with supplies and stuff like that, I, there's no immediate concern per se. You know, I, with our, you know, maximum security guys, I will only allow certain people in my group, you know, I mean, with everybody, I only allow certain people in my groups. So if someone is acting manic or disorganized or being disrespectful or anything like that like it's not like in other populations where they have to come to group to get x y and z like i won't allow them to come to my group for the safety of me and everybody else around them so yeah i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> yeah definitely do you feel like it's easier to be more goal directed being able to control like who's coming to your groups too because i feel like in the setting i work in it's kind of like all right we'll just see who shows up you never know who's going to come to group Versus like knowing who's coming. Yes and no. Everyone's different on every day. So <laughs> while I would like to have a goal and would like to have a intention for the day, I don't always, <laughs> you know, show up, show up and check in. And then we kind of develop a goal as a group most of the time. <laughs> but we do do a lot of, like I have planned interventions, but, you know, I allow them to kind of direct where our processing discussion goes, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the barriers to leisure in this setting are the space, obviously. Mm -hmm. There's certain like base. And then mm -hmm. with the, with knowing like who is safe to come, like you talked about the meeting in the morning. So do you work with Tell us about the team that you're working with, like the, the other therapists. How do you guys collaborate and decide who's safe to come and what behavior? Do you ever have people taken out of your groups in the middle of group because it's not safe? And I guess, how does that work with your the rest of your treatment team? Sure. So our treatment team is made up of kind of everyone that you can think of. It's really, really awesome. We have some psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, some nurses bunch of therapists, some psychologists, caseworkers, social workers, program specialists, like we have the whole clinical team. It's really awesome. And so in our morning meeting, we'll just kind of discuss people who have 
you know, caused any issues in the last 24 hours. And there are times the officers that we work with are incredible and they are very communicative in the sense of like, I'll walk into a section and just kind of check in with people, see if they want to do group that day, because there are some days where they're like, "Mm, no. (laughs) So then, you know, I'm not going to force them to do group because that benefits nobody. And so the officers will kind of check in with me. And if someone's causing issues, they'll let me know. So if that's the case, then they usually just won't come, you know? So the way that the sections are set up, it's like, I just call for group and whoever wants to come can come. And then I have certain groups, like I teach yoga a lot. That's my big thing. My big program that I've started since I've been working in corrections. And so at least in the mental health building. And so specifically with yoga, because it puts you yourself in such vulnerable positions, I will only allow like two or three or four people at a time, depending on the section. And so I just check in with the officers and see how they're feeling about these people. And, you know, they're with them all the time. So they know better than me. Did they, when you first started, did they like train you in this and say like, did the other rec therapist tell you like, Hey, probably a good idea to just like keep three. Or is this like something you've learned as you've, as you've gone along? Yeah, this is just kind of something I've learned. It depends on the section. And so with our maximum security guys, they're not allowed to leave this section. And so they have a little mini yard attached to their section. And so I'll do yoga out there. It'll be interesting to see what happens come winter. But with that group, four is my maximum that I allow just because it is a very high acuity unit. And the more people that you get in there, the higher acute that the people outside become. And obviously that is not a great environment to try to be vulnerable with yourself and express yourself through meditation and movement. But then with a couple of the other sections, I'll usually let more come between like eight and 10. I think 10 is the maximum we can have just because the space is so small. Do you (laughs) have a officer in your groups with you all the time or does it depend on the groups or not? It depends on the groups. So if I'm in the section, there has to be an officer in there. But if I take him out of the section, like we have a whole hallway of like multi-purpose rooms and classrooms. And if you picture a big multi-purpose room or classroom, shrink it down to like a quarter of the size of what you would think it's really little I don't there is usually an officer that like walks up and down the hall every 10 minutes or so and there's cameras in all of the classrooms and multi-purpose rooms uh, so they can see what we're doing and then most of those rooms are across from another section so that officer will just kind of peek over every once in a while cool so sometimes is the answer <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about like the training that you received when you first started in this position? Like, did was it a lot of on the job training? Did was there a specific kind of training you had to go through? We had like a week of kind of an orientation, less of a training, I guess, and more of just like a hey, you work in prison, don't have intimacy with the inmates. That's what they <laughs> call it. <laughs> so that's an obvious one, but I guess it still happens, which is gross. But uh, that definitely breaks a therapeutic bond for sure. Besides that orientation, we, I just kind of hung out with that other rec therapist who's been working there for 18 years. And he introduced me to some of the guys and just kind of the things that he does and has been doing. And then the other rec therapist who I actually took over her position because she is transitioning to another job or another position within the prison. She also kind of showed me around. So I got to see those two different styles and I just kind of walked around and got to know people before I started running groups and got to know the officers before I started to get to know the inmates. And then once I was like, okay, doing that, it was pretty easy from there. Just being yourself and kind of going with the flow is the best way to go about it so that sounds nice kind of like easing into it building rapport with your clients before you have to get thrown into like leading groups because I feel like some of the jobs I've had I show up start to start working and they're like all right you're gonna run like these five groups now and you're like what totally (laughs) think about this so that is very reassuring that in a maximum security prison 
you'd be able to kind of ease into it rather than just being thrown into it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're not all maximum security that we work with, but yeah, it, it's been very, not relaxing, that's not the right word, but it was an easier transition for sure. Just because like I got to make my own schedule and, you know, I can, I have like a minimum amount of groups and, you know, individual sessions that I, I guess have to meet, but it's very flexible. And so it it made it a lot easier for me to just kind of ease into all of that in a high risk environment. <laughs> Yeah. What do your individual sessions look like? Like, do you do the same things that you do in group? Do you like have people that you're working on certain goals with that you meet with regularly? Or like, do you try and meet with everyone one-on-one? -on -one? How does that work for you? Oh gosh, no, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have like a handful of people that I meet with individually. It's starting to become more regular. So the rec therapist who's been there for a long time, he just does groups. And so doing individual sessions is kind of like a new adaptation for the treatment team. So the old rec therapist used to do it and then she wasn't doing rec therapy anymore. So it's a, a re-adaptation, I guess. But basically what those look like is I'll sit down with them. I'll do an assessment. I'll see if they have any goals that they're kind of working towards. A lot of the times it's just to get moving again, just because they were either locked down for for a long time or they had really bad mental health crisis or something that lasted a long time and so they're like I'm so overweight I'm not feeling good like I don't feel like myself so a lot of the times it's just kind of physical goals and so I'll encourage them to come to my yoga groups and we'll just kind of touch base here and there and see what they're doing or how they're doing and then some other times we just work on some art-based stuff like some collaging to kind of focus on we'll pick a word is my favorite one. We'll pick a word and just kind of focus a collage around that word. Sometimes it revolves around like failure or maybe what their crimes had to do with or their background, stuff like that. So that's a really easy one that I like to do with them just because it's stuff that they could do on their own. And then some other times I'll do some like small group slash individual like meditation sessions just because it's a smaller space. And so people can kind of get more in touch with themselves. And then we'll just kind of have a little discussion after of, you know, what helps, what doesn't help that kind of basic questioning and processing. That's really interesting. You said that there's so many, what is your caseload? Like, <laughs> I, I don't even know if I would call it a caseload. <laughs> so we have, there are six sections within our building. There's two geriatric session, sections. There's one women's crisis section. And then there's three men's sections, all of differing acuities. And so I think with the geriatric groups, it's, I usually have like 10 to 12 in those. But in the sections, there's, a, I don't know, maybe 150-ish. And so they kind of rotate in and out with the geriatrics. And then with our guys, we have around a hundred probably within like the mental health area. And then I think there's usually about like 18 or 14 women, something around there. So there's a lot of people in the building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that makes sense that there would be a lot of people and, but you do small groups. So do most of the people not do rec therapy or is it just kind of, they have to wait their turn to get into it? A little of everything. Some people aren't interested. And so we try to kind of get around to everybody within the treatment team in one way, shape or form. Some people really want to do programming. Some people have no interest in it. Some people aren't ready for it. Some people aren't interested in whatever group we're running. So it's kind of a revolving door. I try to keep an open door unless we're doing some like big long project. I try to keep an open door for people that want to join. But we, I do offer certificates at the end of each quarter per se or the end of each group that we do just so the our patients have the ability to take something to the board, like the board of pardons so and parole. 
So that way they have proof that they have done something. So that's usually a pretty good motivator for some people too. So yes, it's optional. Sometimes. <laughs> It's really interesting because it sounds to me like this is kind of like working in a community setting. It's just like with a really mm -hmm. small focused community. You provide programs and like probably have like some regulars and it would really benefit if everyone could come. But it's like, yeah, so it's really, it sounds like a really interesting population in that way because unlike in like a hospital setting or another mental health setting, it's not like, okay, these, this is your therapy. You have to do it. Da, 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 like the same way. So yeah, it's just, it right. sounds interesting. I'm having a lot of fun listening to you tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love my job. So it's easy to talk about. <laughs> and you said too, you left the other position because you felt like rec therapy wasn't maybe respected enough by the other people you're working with or as much. Would you say that in this position, you feel like rec therapy is more of an integral part of the treatment team? I do. Yeah, I definitely feel that way. I mean, it, I think in this field, everything is kind of valued just because, you know, a lot of the people, they can come in and out of prison and, you know, they have, they're at different stages of their lives. And so it is crucial to kind of try to understand where some of these people are at through so many different modalities you know the psychiatrist can go talk to them and they'll tell them one thing and the psychologist will hear another thing and then like the therapist will hear both of those things together and I'll hear something completely different so between like all of us we get to kind of like mend the pieces together and try to understand what's actually going on because <laughs> a lot of the times you know, tracking, talking to all these different people. And uh, a big thing that they did with our training is learning about manipulation and kind of how that works in the brain and and how it presents in the incarcerated setting. So that's been kind of cool to unravel and learn about and see in different patients of ours. That is really fascinating. And just like the way that I wish every treatment team could work. <laughs> yeah. We're just everyone is like collaborating together and figuring out how their speciality can help others in the speciality and how we can all help the clients. So that sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. It, it honestly, it feels magical compared to the last place where they were like, oh, well, you should do rec therapy during the treatment team because like that's just how it is. <laughs> So Understand yeah, that. it's definitely a breath of fresh air. That's awesome. I'm glad you found a good spot that really <laughs> values what you bring to the table and lets you work together with the other members of the team. So yeah. kind of shifting focus from more of the like, what do you do with the job? We're going to talk about the background logistics. So how is your program funded? Like, for example, how do you get the supplies that you get? What does that look like? <laughs> Uh, so sometimes I don't even know the answer to that question. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, I will fill out a purchase order and give it to who I'm supposed to give it to and hope for the best. <laughs> so okay. we, with mental health, we were under the Department of Corrections forever. And then this past July 1st, the Department of Health and Human Services kind of took over our department of, you know, medical, mental health. So it is changing. I do obviously work for the state. And so it comes from that somewhere. <laughs> Interesting. So, so you were, so like the, the Utah State Department of Corrections was over your program and now Utah State Department of Health and Human Services is over your program. Is Correct. That yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What is it like, do you usually get approved for things or like? I guess what what does it feel like the budget is like does it feel like I could ask for anything and they'll give it or does it feel like it's pretty limited in what I can get it kind of feels like I can ask for anything I I mean it's as long as custody approves it 
So like there are certain things where, you know, the officers are like, oh, that's probably not a good idea. And so like, if that's the case, obviously we're not going to order it. But so that's something that I always have to check in with first and just make sure it's going to be okay with them and they feel safe about it and comfortable with it. And then the rest is, I just hope for the best that I have no idea. I asked what the budget is and they don't know. So (laughs) until they tell me, no, I'm going to keep trying to order stuff. (laughs) That's really cool. So when you're saying like things that they don't feel are safe, I'm thinking things like scissors, like you can't have scissors in your programs or can you, or like. I can. Yeah. Yeah. It's more of like, um, things that can be taken apart easily. So like a pool table, that was something that they, I guess, had in our last prison and the officers in this, you know, new facility that we're in were like, uh, no. So Mm -hmm. things that can be taken apart and screws and stuff like that, that can potentially be used for a farm else. So they're allowed, to, they're allowed to, you know, at my discretion, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. So when you when you say you want to order yoga mats, do you go to like a certain person in correction, like a certain officer? Are they like your purchase person? Or do you just like sit down with the treatment team and say, I want to order like this pool table and then everyone kind of gives their thoughts on it? Or is there like a more specific, if I turn it into this guy and he approves it, then I can turn it into this guy and they approve it. How does that work? Yeah, pretty much. I will usually go talk to our lieutenant and just kind of hear his thoughts on it. Like I'm trying to order some sound bowls and they make me a little bit nervous. So I was like, I'm going to go talk to him and make sure. So that's a pretty good example. And he's like, you know, as long as you're in control of them and the inmates don't have access to them outside of what you're doing with it, then I think it's okay. And so once I get approval for that, I'll fill out a purchase order and I'll give it to our office manager who is under Health and Human Services. Because Health and Human Services took over, we have to kind of work a little bit closer with custody. Not that we weren't before, but just to kind of double check everything here and there. And so I have to be like, oh, well, like, you know, lieutenant approved it. So, so here, here's this, please order. (laughs) Cool. How long does it take for you to get your equipment? Oh, gosh, don't ask. (laughs) (laughs) It's a long time. (laughs) Um, It depends. So because of work for the state, we have certain vendors that we have to try to go through first. And they'll take forever. You know, like, so we moved to this new prison last July. I haven't worked there yet. But last July. And this other rec therapist he was like yeah I ordered stuff before we even moved to like make sure that we had stuff and I didn't get it until January Mm. so you know like some things can take six months but I ordered something or I tried to order something off of Amazon and I got it two weeks later so it honestly just depends on who is managing the whole mail and delivery system I guess that week (laughs) That makes sense. That that that's probably very normal. But we definitely experienced that working. We worked federal with like federal government funding. And so it was very similar. Like you have to go through certain vendors. Sometimes they approve, sometimes they don't, sometimes they come back. So right. Sense. Exactly. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> but it it's definitely like everything you're saying is definitely debunking like myths that I've had in my head about like what is a lot. Like I have imagined like very like strict on what you're allowed to take in and everyone's watching it and then things like that so it's definitely making these things more comfortable for me to to imagine like what it would be like if I was an RT in this setting so thank you glad to hear it (laughs) so okay so you say you love where you work so we want to hear what are some great things about where you work about what you're doing I know we've kind of talked about some of them like as we've gone, but just to lay it out, like what are some great things about where you work and what are some hard things about where you work? Oh man. I mean, honestly, like what we were talking about, the treatment team is incredible and the relationship that our treatment team has with our custody staff is so helpful. You know, it's like, I I've heard, you know, some horror stories in some of the other 
buildings that we work with and the custody staff is just very resistant to mental health or they're very resistant to getting an inmate certain medical treatment because they ask for it every five minutes, which I understand is frustrating sometimes. But with our building, I mean, it's cool because the officers want to learn more about mental health for those that are new. And so they are able to hopefully recognize, you know, if an inmate is decompensating or just acting different from their baseline. And so it's really cool that they kind of start to recognize what baselines are for the different people that we have. And that is really, really interesting to just kind of see. And I get to learn more about too, you know, my background is more adaptive sport. And so I've only been working in mental health for two years and it's been really neat to kind of go through the psychiatric setting. And then also, I guess, continue with the psychiatric setting of just being in a different environment. And then I think just some of the hard things is our space. We don't have that much space. And with there being two rec therapists and with the new prison, we don't really have a gym. We not, we don't really have a gym. We don't have a gym, <laughs> period. And so we can't do, you know, that kind of like workouts and stuff like that, that I guess they used to do at the old prison. They used to have like a ceramic studio and a kitchen that they could work in and they used to have a bunch of stuff that I'm, I didn't have because I wasn't at the old prison. And so I'm learning about all these things and trying to adapt with everybody else. of the small space that we do have and just kind of working with custody. And that was a definitely a more of a challenge for me just because I was working with techs and nurses and stuff at my last job. And so working with you know, correctional officers is definitely a change of pace. That was a hard adaptation for me. But like I said, they've been wonderful and learning. I've learned a lot from them too. And a lot of the officers that we work with have been working in mental health for, you know, four or five or six years or 12. It's helpful to learn from them too. And I think another challenging thing about where I work is as much as I love to go with the flow, sometimes I like have a plan for the day and then the plan just like disintegrates because there's some sort of incident or something happens one way, shape or form, or none of the inmates want to go to group or someone's cranky. And so it throws off the whole section. And so that is, has definitely been a challenge. You know, at my old job, I was very structured of you have the group at this time, this time, this time, and this time. And now I'm like, well, I guess, Maybe I'll try to have group at two. It might be three. It might be 1.30. It might just have to wait till tomorrow. So yeah, trying to have those groups. And I always have to, if I'm taking a group out of a section, I have to be escorted with an officer. So, but then they just kind of like drop us off in whatever room that we're going to. So timing wise is challenging. It's like, I want to have group for an hour, but sometimes it's like, 40 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour and 10 minutes because of just like where our custody staff is located at the moment. (laughs) What I'm appreciated about what you're saying is that there's like some things that are really hard, but it seems like everyone that's working this setting gets that it's really hard. And so there's not this pressure, like Carol was saying, like, you know, pressure to start immediately when you don't understand the population or so it's, it's nice. It sounds like it's nice in the way that you have to go with a flow and everyone is okay with that. Like, it's okay. It's like, no one is getting upset at you for being like, oh, sorry, I can't do group. Everyone is not okay. It's like, yeah, you're right. They're not yeah. okay. This is probably not a good idea. <laughs> and so that's really, I I can imagine that would be really refreshing and just kind of give you license to trust your instincts on that and to trust like your therapeutic knowledge of what would be helpful in these settings. So that's it, sounds, it, it would definitely be frustrating though I can totally see how it's like yeah we could have been done but here we are just waiting for you know logistics of someone to pick someone up or or do these things and so yeah I can see that you would have to have the attitude that you have right of just like if yeah you were to fight, it would be really really hard to feel fulfilled because you would just constantly feel like my plans are tossed to the wind kind of thing yeah definitely 
And it's not always our building too, you know, like our officers respond to the maximum security building. So if anything happens in there that they need help with and our building gets shut down and I can't do anything. So it's not even just us. If something happens, it's the surrounding buildings. If something happens and they need help too. So it happens frequently where, <laughs> or at least it for the last couple of months, it's happened frequently, unfortunately, sad, but. Is it That's frequently like or... every week or every day? Like what, what kind of does it look like for you? I would say the last couple, the last knock on wood, <laughs> um, the last two weeks or so it's been okay. But the six, four to six weeks before that, it was at least once a week. Oh, so, wow. which is, yeah, really exhausting for the officers. And, you know, I, the inmates are obviously very on edge a lot, so it doesn't really help any therapeutic need. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult to deliver a meditation session when everyone is on edge. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And we all have radios. And so I got to keep that on. And that's also a little bit of a challenge just to make sure that I'm up to date. And if someone needs me or if I need someone to have the radio on and so it's not as quiet as I would like it to be during a meditation session sometimes but obviously that is safety is more important than silence <laughs> have you ever gotten to work and been told you need to leave or or like has that ever happened or like something where they're like it's actually like not safe we don't want you to do anything here today or is it like manageable enough that it's like that's nah, okay you can still be here just don't go to these places yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I know I have not had that happen before. There's been one or two days where I'll walk into like our maximum security ish section. It's kind of a mix between like maximum security guys and population guys, but it's just like our most acute and locked down section. And so I've walked in there a couple mornings to do yoga and the officers will look at me and be like, uh, I would not do that today. And so I respect that when they ask me not to. And, you know, you can just, like you said, trust your instincts. And I can feel when a section doesn't feel right or stable. I just try to listen to that as much as I can. And if, I, if I'm if i tired or if I don't feel 100%, I will kind of back off on the group a little bit and just kind of try to do it a different day or try to do it at a different time to try to mitigate whatever could possibly happen especially if some of the guys will walk up and be like I don't feel good today or you know they haven't blinked in four minutes you <laughs> you just try to watch for those signs <laughs> what do you do when you don't run a group like if you're expecting you to do a group and then it gets canceled do you work on paperwork what does that time look like yeah I have some paperwork or I'll go into other sections and just check in on some people we've been really short staffed therapy wise and social worker wise so per you know, the rec therapy licensure in Utah, I will do my best to help the other parts of our treatment team as best I can in, in whatever way I can. I check on supplies if we need those, some purchase orders, go kind of socialize with some inmates in the other sections and just try to build some extra rapport of just being in there and just so they can hopefully one day want to come to group. So I fill my time somehow, some days, some days I'll just, you know, try to read some research articles and try to find new interventions to use, mm -hmm. but yeah, it just kind of depends. Sure. That sounds, it sounds like, it, it sounds like you do very well. <laughs> it sounds like you do very well <laughs> trying to figure out what to do. I'm like, oh yeah, that, that sounds like a great idea. And yeah. And again, <laughs> just, I just really love that. That's like, that's totally like that they just trust your instincts on that. Like if you're, if you're going and being like, oh yeah, I'm just going to go and talk to these people to try and help them feel safe and comfortable coming to group, that that's a totally acceptable thing to do with your time. That's really, it's really good. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any special certifications or training that you need to work in this setting or things that you might recommend that someone considering working as rec therapist in corrections should maybe look into getting? Oh man, I don't think anything formal. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I think it's definitely helpful to have some clinical knowledge 
in some way, shape, or form, just to kind of recognize and bring to the treatment team of what different symptoms look like with different diagnoses. I, being part of this whole big treatment team, have learned a lot about my medication and I, I still honestly have no idea about it, but I'm trying to learn. So that's been pretty helpful of just trying to understand like what medication does what. But I mean, as for any certifications or trainings, it's just kind of what I think it's mostly just hands-on experience, to be honest with you. I don't think there's any trainings or any certifications you could do to then be 100% confident walking into a prison, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> that makes sense it's probably pretty hard to replicate the experience that you get from actually working in that setting yeah I mean maybe some like martial arts training just in case but <laughs> yeah, have, you had that. Use, have you had to use self-defense training in your job I haven't I haven't no I know and a lot of the people that we work with are they don't always say the most appropriate things or do the most appropriate things but you know they know that if something were to happen staff wise they number one wouldn't be allowed to come to group and number two they would just get locked down and not be able to do anything or they would end up in our psych hallway which is very isolated and very restricted you know they can't have anything and that a lot sure. of the times they kind of get their with they're really psychotic or they're hurting themselves or others. And so, you know, sometimes they end up there, but so it's kind of more no, like a privilege to be able to participate in groups and in programming. Groups. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I've heard that you make good money working in a prison system. Can you, <laughs> is that true? Or, or what is the compensation like for you? Sure. Yeah. I, it's definitely better significantly than my last job. So that was also a very good deterrent for me to leave my last job. <laughs> definitely better. It's just, I think, a struggle, honestly, being in Utah. If you look at, you know, the median wage for rec therapists around the country in different settings, it's Utah is pretty low on the charts for being a licensed state. So um, it's livable is the answer that I will <laughs> give to that <laughs> question. But because I work for the state and stuff like that, there's a lot of really good benefits to it, you know, with healthcare and just being part of the whole community of the state and having a few degrees, which means a lot of student debt. And so that's a pretty good benefit, hopefully one day of the state being able to help me pay that off. Forgive. With yeah. that big question mark. <laughs> Yes, do, they, awesome. do they offer like a pension for your position, the state? Yeah. So I got to choose. There was like a 401k option. There's a pension option. And then there was a combination because I'm not from Utah. I like to explore different places. I would love to stay here for as long as I can. And like I said, I, I love my job, but I just chose the 401k option probably because it's a little bit safer. And yeah. because I'm not a certified officer as a civilian staff, the pension payout time is 25 years instead of 20 as an officer. So that sounds like a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really like our, our, our generation is not really into the, let's have one job for 25 years. It's very yeah. hard. Yeah. The same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <We> like to... <laughs> exactly. So we talked about some of the interventions that you did. You do yoga and meditation, art. What is your favorite intervention to do? What's the one you enjoy most doing with your with your people? <laughs> I love doing yoga. They they have a or I guess there was a yoga program that started at the prison years ago. Um, but they did it in like the women's population and in our programming building. Um, with, you know, substance use and that kind of treatment, but they never had it in mental. And so that was like the big thing of when I started. And I think when I interviewed was, it was something, or it is something that I am incredibly passionate about. And it has saved me on uh, countless occasions. And a lot of the guys and women, you know, they've never experienced it. They've never done it. 
And so it's really cool that I get to kind of introduce that to them and help them build their own practice. And being in such a high, acute and intense environment, you know, sometimes for sometimes it's eight months or, you know, a few months, or sometimes it's, you know, 25 or years or more. So being in an environment that is that I'm going to use the word unstable most of the time, or that unstructured, um, it forces your body to stay in that, you know, fight or flight kind of sense. And so a lot of these people that I work with are so disconnected from their bodies and can tell them that or ask them to kind of notice a sensation in their foot and they're like I don't know what that means or if you kind of talk about some sort of connection between your head and your body they just like they can't understand or connect it because they're so far disconnected from their bodies since they're in that intense state all the time of just just like trying to protect themselves and survive so it's been really really cool to for the last you know, six months that I've been doing this to kind of see a transformation in some of the guys of being like, whoa, like I'm making that connection of, you know, mind and body and mm-hmm. spirit and emotions and all that kind of stuff. That sounds really cool. That is, that gave me chills. Like <laughs> just thinking about <laughs> uh, what you're able to provide for them and, and th- that therapeutic benefit that they can receive to be able to like feel those emotions again and get out of that fight or flight for a little bit and just um it's really healthy (laughs) really good yeah yeah it's really neat so you know a lot of the times like I said they're stuck in this and they're told what they have to do when they have to be certain places how they have to look where they have to you know present themselves at different times of the day or it's they're they never have freedom to just like have autonomy over themselves and so I I love that I get to provide that even if it's just for, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour or whatever time we have together to actually teach them that they can have autonomy and some self-efficacy and connect back to themselves. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That's really cool. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know that we've, we've, we've gone into this a lot as we're, we've been talking because this is when Carol and I were discussing talking to you, we, we definitely were like the safety concerns, like, what is that like for you? And so I know we've, we've gone into this deeply, I think throughout this interview, (laughs) but are there any other, are there any things that we haven't covered about like the safety concerns that you're thinking about that you think people should be aware of if they're thinking about working in corrections or are you, are you ever scared? Are you ever like nervous for yourself or is it like, no, everyone's doing their job and I know that it's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's more of just, you know, everyone is super supportive of mental health and rec therapy. The officers are always very supportive and they always keep a pretty close eye. So, I mean, safety wise, like I said, I only let certain people in my group. And if I'm questioning someone, I'll talk to the officers about it or I'll talk to our team about it or both and just kind of see where everyone's at. And then with yoga, just because there are, it's such a, it can be such a vulnerable modality. I make sure that the guys come or women come to my other, like more structured groups first of more recreation therapy, whether it's games or art or whatever that is. And so I make sure that they come to those groups first, just so I can get to know them and they can get to know me. And so that kind of mitigates the safety concern a little bit more with, with yoga. So other than that, there are certain times where some officers don't feel comfortable and they'll express that to me and they'll hang around a little bit closer. Or if someone wants to come to my group and I don't know them or I don't, particularly feel the safest with them. I'll ask an officer to stay with me and they have never, ever, ever questioned it. So other than that, no safety concerns per se. And I work in a prison, so it's, I definitely don't ever feel a hundred percent safe. And I think if I ever did, I should probably stop working in this, in this field. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it sounds like 
everyone's just very good at risk management. And that is kind of the focus is like, yes, we understand the population, we understand what we're doing. And so managing and having the supportive staff is probably would probably make a world of difference to me to know that like, mm -hmm. if I was feeling nervous, I could ask someone to come in and help and that would make it okay. Carol, did you have any other questions about that? <laughs> Are there any myths that you've heard of working in corrections that you could speak to? Maybe debunk or be like, that's true. Oh man. Oh, I guess a lot of the time new people will come into work and we'll all kind of sit down and be like, oh, like these people are great. These people are great, you know? And they're like, what? Like we're working in prison. How are they great? <laughs> but oh, I think that's a big one of just kind of taking away or, or bringing the person back, you know, and focusing on the whole person instead of just what they've done or yeah. what happened to them and stuff like that. Just because that is a really hard thing. And if, if, I mean, if anyone was just focused on the crimes that they committed, then there's no therapeutic benefit to that whatsoever. Yeah. And it's more about just judgment instead of healing. So that's a, that's definitely a, a big one. I don't know if there's any other ones that you guys have heard. I'm happy to speak on it. <laughs> I think that that would be the biggest one that I would want like my my own like mental state to be when going into corrections is like yeah being able to see the whole person and being able to look past the the crimes. Um I I definitely heard like a myth about the like having like very limited supplies so you definitely spoke to that one. No, we have supplies and telling us about these buildings you've had like oh yeah we had ceramics lab at this last prison like that was definitely I definitely had a myth in my head of stone walls nothing <laughs> like uh, well, that's what this one's like unfortunately yeah why did the um, why did all those things go away so they moved they moved okay <laughs> period just, just like a so, new prison building new building yeah so they the land that the prison was on was very uh, expensive. So they built a new one and moved so that they could build condos and other housing <laughs> options. <laughs> so for so whoever lives there. Into the new prison? <laughs> oh man, I hope so. I mean, they used to have like greenhouses and kitchens and you know, they used to have so much stuff. Apparently they used to have these big multi-purpose rooms and gyms a whole bunch of workout equipment and we have a basketball court but I guess they used to have like a bigger yard with all these manicured ball fields and they used to just have a bunch more stuff which is a, a major bummer but yeah. we don't really have that so we've had to improvise a lot and oh man and another huge barrier that we have at this new prison is the mosquitoes are horrible so because they built a prison on the only swamp land in Utah. And so no one really ever wants to go outside in the summer when it's nice out because you get eaten alive. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that really does kind of support the stigma of prisoners. And we're like not really trying to give them the best necessarily. We're just trying to house them and do what we got to do. Yeah. Whoever built the prison definitely did not work with the people that actually work there <laughs> yeah <laughs> well I guess this kind of goes into the next question one of our last questions is if you had ten thousand dollars for your program all the ceramics left I don't know if you could do that with ten thousand <laughs> but if you had ten thousand dollars for your program what would you spend it on oh my gosh um we did honestly just need more space so I guess we're that would be my biggest, my biggest thing is just to add, add some more like actual multi-purpose rooms, usable ones that we can put a gym in or like gardening and horticulture was such a huge thing for a lot of the guys at the old prison and they don't have that anymore. And that was a big like recreation therapy tool for them. So I think I would just spend it more on space and kind of giving them what they need and yeah I, I don't really have anything specific I guess but other than space and things yeah. to put in the space that is really disappointing that 
because usually when you think new places, I was like a little confused when you were talking because usually when you think new, you think, oh, it's updated. It has more things for us. Like it has more. So that's really disappointing <laughs> that they built a new place that has less. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been so good. I've loved like hearing all of your, all of your thoughts on these things. I've loved kind of getting a better picture of what it would be like if I was a recreation therapist working in corrections. And I hope people listening will, will also feel that way. Do you take interns at the Utah State Corrections? And how does that process work for the interns? Do they have to apply far in advance to get background checks? Like how does that all work for you? That's a great question. <laughs> so I guess they used to have interns and they haven't had them in several years. So that is something that I would love to explore because it's the state. I mean, they, and it's a, you know, you need a security clearance. So they do need a background check and all that stuff. I think it took me like about two weeks to get clearance. So it's not significant, mm. but I have no clue what an internship would look like at the moment just because we're in this big transition from one department to another if anyone's interested I would love to explore that <laughs> but for right now we don't have any okay so if someone was interested maybe we can just give them your your professional email and they can email you and ask because maybe if you, if you guys don't have it maybe another department somewhere how many are there are there other prisons in the state of utah like is this the only prison in the state of utah are there other rec therapists that work in corrections in the state of utah other than you two you know not that i know of there are there's another prison down in central utah to my knowledge there aren't any rec therapists or i haven't spoken with any if there are but so it's just just two of us for now (laughs) Oh, cool. Well, so if you're in the Mountain West and you're interested, we can give you Ellie's professional email and you can ask her and she can maybe you can get them connected with other people or find out if Utah Health and Human Services wants to let interns come to the corrections. <laughs> Definitely. I know there are other departments have interns like at the Utah State Hospital and stuff. So they have a program somewhere, just not a corrections yet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's so good. Thank you so much, Ellie, for sharing all of your experience with us. I feel like I learned so much about the setting of corrections. I honestly think you're the first direct therapist that I've talked to that works in corrections. So this has been really eye-opening for me about what it's like and kind of makes me feel like I could work in that kind of setting. <laughs> well, awesome. Glad to be the voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely like made it more accessible to me too. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming and thank you everyone for listening. And if you if you want those contact information, we'll have it in our show notes at realtalkrecreationtherapy.com. So thank you guys and we'll see you next time. All right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Real Talk Recreation Therapy. If you're looking for some of the information that we talked about today, you can find it on our show notes at www.realtalkrecreationtherapy.com. And if you enjoyed this episode and some of the other episodes we put out, we would love to have you like, follow, subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on whatever podcast platform you listen to us on. Thank you so much for your support, and we hope you'll join us for the next episode. Bye!